We come thank you for allowing us to still meet in freedom and in truth to honor you and your son for what you have done for us in our lives, Lord. For those that are here today, Lord, I ask that every ear be open, hearts be receptive, and minds be understanding of the words and answers that you have chosen to be shared. For those that aren't with us, for those that are sick today, we have several that have called in and that we know of, Lord. I speak against COVID right now. In the name of Jesus, it has no place any longer in any of our lives, Father. For the fevers that are on some of our young, Father God, I, I speak against that today. I ask Jehovah Rapha, the healer, to take place over their lives, Father God. Lord, for those that are still traveling that aren't with us, bring them back safely to us next week, Lord. Lord, for the, for the cards that are being mailed out this week, the 10,000 plus cards of invitation that are being mailed out, Lord, I speak your special anointing over those so that we can fill this place with other people that need to believe and know who you are and trust in you, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for our lives, for the safe travel that you gave Karen and I, and for, for Rebecca's message that she delivered last week, Lord. I, I, I truly appreciate that and all that you do for us. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen and amen. All right, watch your eyes as Karen turns on the lights and Rebecca makes her way up to speak. I don't know about y'all, but the presence of the Lord got me this morning during the music and I got a little teary. So thank you, Heather, for that because that was absolutely amazing. I'm so thankful that she's here every week to do that for us. Uh, thank you for traversing across Kerrville today, whether it be by bike, feet, car, swimming. I felt like we were about to have to get out of the car and swim to get here this morning because we went, we live close to Center Point, and we went all the way by Tally Elementary to turn around because there was just not a spot for us to get through. So thank y'all for being here. I know it was tough to get here this morning. We uh, have several options for you to give. You can give in person by the door. If you are somebody who gives in cash, we appreciate that just as much, but we can't give you that tax, um, and we can't give you the tax write-off for it, and we can't log into the computer appropriately. So we finally got some envelopes for you that if you pay in cash, it is right next to the basket. You can put your name. If you wanna put your address at least the first time that you do it, that's great, so we can make sure it's correct in the computer. Um, and then the, you don't have to worry about the amount because we'll be counting it anyway and I can write it on there and make sure to put it in the computer um, for you so we can keep track of your giving. Uh, you can give online at findtransformation.com slash giving. You can text the word transformation to 830-293-4483 or you can give on our app. If you haven't yet checked into Facebook, go ahead and do that. Pull out that phone, go to the Facebook app, Click like you're making a post, and then you'll have the option to check in. Uh, we want everybody to know where you go to church. Uh, like Dad said, we've got mail outs going out, so we can hopefully expose transformation to multiple families, multiple people uh, here in the Kerrville and surrounding areas. And maybe if they see you share it and they get that card in the mail, maybe they're going to be more inclined to come. So go ahead and post that you are here. We are happy to pray with you at any time. Prayer is a powerful thing, and we are happy to pray with you in person. You can text the word prayer to 830-293-4483. You can write your prayer request on the back of a transformation card right outside the door, um, or you can even submit your prayer request on our app. If you don't have our app yet, go to Google Play or the App Store, and you can download Church by Ministry 1. Once you have that downloaded, you're searching for Transformation Church Kerrville. You have access to sermons, ways to give, ways to contact us, your prayer requests, and Bible study signups when those are when those are going on. Next week is Divided in Christ on Luke 12, and I know Dad's excited to preach on that one. Uh, but I think I'm most excited today because I'm waiting to see if you could stump the pastor. Thanks. You're welcome. Hey, where's your QR codes? Oh, yeah, I forgot to say my QR codes. If uh, there's one by the door, I'm so sorry. <laughs> there's a QR code right outside the door that'll just make sure that your information is correct in our system. So go ahead and scan it on your way out, and it'll link right to the website for you. You know, 
this stump the pastor thing was not meant to be stump the pastor. Am I wrong? You're wrong. Oh, couldn't hear myself. Because so. well, you're behind the speaker. Because I'm behind the speaker? Is that it? Uh -huh. Okay. Well, normally I can hear something, but not today. You know, guys, I am, uh, let me tell you, I'm glad to be back, number one. But I'm also, my ears are just getting bombarded with, oh, she did such a great job. Oh, she was awesome. Like, I'm like, do you even need me? So I'm going to let her come out and deliver the stuff the past. Oh, no. Oh, no, she's not ready for that. So uh, good morning. We are so glad to be back. Karen and I had a wonderful trip. Uh, I'm just going to put a plug out there for Boston. If you've never been there, you've got to go. It is so rich in Christian history as well as our nation's history. It's an awesome place to go. So uh, you were absolutely missed last week, I'm telling you. Um, something else happened on the trip, but I didn't even put it in my notes to talk about. Those of you that have been coming for a while, you know that I am a, well, anything Pittsburgh fan. I bleed black and gold, Steelers, Pirates, Penguins. So at my company's conference this last weekend, we had a guest speaker. They bring one in every year, and this year, they brought in Rocky Blyer. And for those of you that don't know who Rocky Blyer was, he was a gentleman who played for the Steelers one season, got drafted to Vietnam, and got half his foot and his legs really, well, half the foot blown off, and all the muscles in his legs were torn up to bits. They said he would never walk again, let alone play football. He was in his, um, in, in recovery after surgery after surgery, and received a letter from Art Rooney, the owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers, and said, Rock, we need you back. And that's all it took. They kept him on payroll for two years as he went through rehab, and then he started playing again. And it was incredible. He had a, a, a fascinating season, or, or years of seasons, with the Pittsburgh Steelers, and he was our guest speaker, and I got to meet him, and I got pictures with him, and it was it was a joyous event for me. So anyway, <laughs> uh, we want you to know that we love you guys. We are so glad you're here. Those watching online, we love you too. Come join us in person sometime. Uh, and again, as I said in my prayer, we have some people that are out sick. Uh, COVID's hit them, and we just are uh, speaking against that. So uh, we want you all to, to know how to love God, love people, and live what he has designed you for. That's everybody, all of us. All right, so I know I'm going to ask the question anyway. How did she do last week? <laughs> Becca, I truly appreciate you filling in. And don't forget, you get to do it again in a few short weeks. Yeah, no. Just say it. <laughs> All right, so today's message is Ask the Pastor. So uh, lovingly renamed Stump the Pastor because Becca thought it would be funny. But I wanted, today to, I wanted this day to be for you. I wanted you guys to have the opportunity to ask questions that were pressing uh, things that you've heard, things that you've said or heard said, or just questions about scripture in general on why something is what it is. So I'll do my best to share with you what God has shown me about these areas and to provide you with information um, if you are ever confronted with one of these questions. Now, if you didn't respond to my request, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that we may have a few moments at the end of this that you might be able to ask me a question. I'll try to shoot from the hip and see how, how we do. It all depends on how we do this today. So, I'm also not going to say who asked the questions. Okay? And the reason I want to do that, if you want to be acknowledged for it, that's fine. You can say, hey, that was me, that was mine. But out of confidence for you, I have chosen not to reveal who asked some of these questions. Fair enough? Are you listening? Fair? Okay. Thumbs up. There we go. All right, so let's get started. The first question came to me right after we completed the series, Return of the King. It was, why does the New Jerusalem need walls? I'm guessing that that question came from our topic in Revelation 21, where John, one of Jesus' disciples, had the vision of the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down from the heavens. So let's take a look at what that passage said. Revelation 21, 12 through 14 said, It had a great high wall with 12 gates, with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now if we read further into that scripture, 
we will see that the wall measured 1,200 stadia, I'm sorry, 12,000 stadia in both length and height. That would be about 1,400 miles long by 1,400 miles high. So again, the question was, why does the New Jerusalem need walls? I found a few commentaries that sum up why God shared this description with us. The first comes from John MacArthur. He said, so that our humanness and the understanding that we currently have would know that this eternal place that we are going to is just not something floating in space. It's real. It has walls attached to foundations, which again, in our current state of understanding, we know that if a, fall, if a foundation is solid, that the house isn't going anywhere. Ellicott's commentary says that there is perhaps an allusion to the wilderness encampment and to, re, and to the readjustment of the order of the tribes that are found in Ezekiel 48. But he continues on saying that there is more than order here. The gates lie open to all quarters. There is no refusal of admission to any people. This represents, or that representatives of all the nations, all kindreds, all people, and tongues are in the city of Christ. In him there is neither barbarian, sicton, bond, or free, but all are one. The diversities of human nationality and character of age, race, and climate are brought into one communion and fellowship. Okay? The Barnes commentary said, it brings to mind that all ancient cities were surrounded with walls for protection. God is just reminding us of the ultimate protection that we have in him. The New Jerusalem doesn't need a wall. We know that. But believers will no longer suffer there. No wicked persons will enter the state that we will be in in heaven. In fact, there will not be any wickedness in the new earth anyway because the second judgment has already come and God has taken care of Satan once again, once and for all. The wall is provided for symbolic reasons to show each and every believer that we will now be fully protected. Now my answer, simple. God said there'd be walls, so there'll be a wall. That was easy, wasn't it? All right. I have two questions that come from the book of 1 Corinthians. So we're going to look at, uh, we're going to go there first. So here's the first one. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It reads, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out. So that you can endure it. So the question asked about this verse is what does this passage mean? In other words, explain what God not allowing me to be tempted means and how he will provide a way out enabling me to endure. Can you see that question coming out of that? Okay, great. Here's what I have. In context... This passage describes how the generation of Israelites who escaped from Egypt were blessed by God and yet fell repeatedly into idol worship. God severely punished all of many of them by including the fate of wandering through the wilderness until they died. The Corinthians should read their example as a warning unless they too fall at God's hands for participating with idols. If you remember the book of Corinthians, Paul is speaking to a church, the church in Corinth, that followed idol worship, even though they said they were believers, much like some big denominational religion we have today that looks towards idols. Their standing in Christ does not mean that God will act out or will not act out against them, or against their unfaithfulness to him with false gods. Still, such temptations are common 
And God always provides his children a way to escape from sin. You see, many people have misconceptions about this verse. They feel that this verse means that... Can you go back to the verse? Okay. Um, many of them think that God will allow bad things to happen that we can't handle. And that part is not true. Guess what? You... Me, we can't handle anything anyway. God's showing us that we need to trust Him because God can handle anything. Our lives are not different than Paul's, the writer of 1 Corinthians. He experienced hardship after hardship after hardship. He was under great pressure, far beyond anyone's ability to endure. The 39 lashes that Christ received before His crucifixion Paul received twice. Yet he endured. And he was not God's son. Yet they gave him, God gave him the strength to endure. God allowed Paul and he allows us to go through difficult times. Times that are sometimes appear to be too much for us to bear. He does this. So that we learn to lean on God for our strength and not rely on ourselves. Now in this verse, Paul is talking, he's talking about extreme, deadly experiences that we can endure. No, he's specifically dealing with two things. Carnal temptations. And in that, I'll explain in a minute. These temptations are not new they're, in fact, as Scripture says, common to mankind. And we all face them every day. Paul was doing his best to encourage the church in Corinth and to use, and for us, to anchor ourselves to God for spiritual strength to resist falling into sin. The Greek word tempted and temptation in this verse could be interchanged with testing and tested. God is not the one testing. He is, however, allowing us to be tested. All right, now let me break the verse down for you again. So now I think you can catch up, James. Yep. First part of the verse, no temptation has overtaken you. This means just what it says, that there is no temptation, no trial, no burden that you have faced or will face that could lead you to abandon your faith and commit sin. Notice something. I did not say that there was no trial or burden you have faced or would face that could lead you to commit sin. I said abandon your faith and commit sin. There's a big difference between the way you look at this. I hate to tell you, but we're all <coughs> sinners. You, me, every single one of us, we sin. But as believers, though, have you abandoned your faith? No. You just sin. All right, the next section. Accept that which is common to mankind. So what is common to mankind? What does that mean? Two things. Talks about it in here. Sexual sin... And complaining, grumbling. We see in verse 8 and 10, the temptations we face are the exact same faced by other people. You are not the only one going through sexual sin temptations or grumblings or complaining. You are not unique in that sense. You are, but you're not when it comes to this. The next line, and God is faithful. These words were specifically chosen to point out that while Satan and many of our neighbors are deceitful, God will always be on our side regardless of the troubles that we have. God does not lie and he keeps his promises. Next, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. God knows your capacity. 
He knows what each and every one of us have to deal with on a daily basis when it comes to temptation. And he does protect us from temptations that are too much for us to handle. Finally, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God gives us strength to bear and not succumb to our sinful urges. However, if and when we fall and we fall into, or we fail and we fall into sin, God allows us to repent and turn back to Him to restore our relationship with Him. Make sense? All in all, this verse should be taken as encouragement to the believer, not condemnation. Why do I say that? Because church, we will not reach a point in our walk that we will not be free from temptation until we arrive at our place of victory with Christ, which doesn't happen until the resurrection. You see, you need to also understand that God has placed limitations on Satan and what he can do or tempt you with here on earth. Finally, if you are tempted or tested and you walk away from it, that is a victory. This is like removing the dross from the refiner's fire. You have taken something that, 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 that really got you and you walked away from it at that time. You passed. You have the victory. Not saying that there's not going to be another time that dross has to be removed. But each and every time you can walk away, you're getting better and better. The next question that comes from 1 Corinthians is based on chapter 15, verse 29, which reads, Now if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? All right. So question three, the way I look at it, has two parts. Here they are. What does it mean being baptized on behalf of the dead? And if the dead are not raised at all, why be baptized for them? Anybody ever run across that verse before? Anybody ever figure that out going, what does this mean? Okay. Okay. Here's how you answer this question, or here what God is showing me. We need to first understand the context of which Paul is writing 1 Corinthians 15, specifically verses 12 through 34, not just what you saw on the screen. This would cover both before the verse and after the verse. So what do these verses mean? They describe all the implications for Christians if there is no resurrection at all. Most importantly, what would it mean that Christ was not raised from the dead? Now, we believe that Christ was raised from the dead, right? So there is a resurrection. If Christ was not raised, then Paul's preaching of the gospel would be false. And the faith of those who believe in it would be worthless. All would remain in sin. Christ, though was raised from the dead. And when he returns for those who are his, all who have died in Christ will be resurrected to new life as he was after his crucifixion. Finally, Christ will reign on earth before delivering the kingdom to the Father. Now, Paul is not advocating that there is such a thing as baptism for the dead. His claim is that Christians will be physically resurrected in the end times just as Christ was resurrected physically after the cross. Now, some scholars think that this baptism question, this baptism for the dead, was being practiced by the church in Corinth. But if it were, Paul would have addressed it as being false in other areas of his writing. This is the only spot he talks about. Looking at commentaries on this, I found one very interesting. Jimmy Swaggart's take was pretty spot on. And here's what he said. 
Then as now, erroneous doctrine was rampant everywhere. No doubt, some people outside the church of Corinth were practicing baptizing, baptizing for the dead. Meaning that if a friend or a loved one could be baptized in water on behalf of someone who had previously died but was not saved, and as such would ensure their salvation. Paul, no doubt, had heard all of this, as well as all types of other false doctrines. And now, he casually mentions this fact without going into detail. Quite possibly, those who were teaching such error were also teaching that there is no resurrection of the dead. So the apostle puts the two together, baptizing for the dead and no resurrection, and uses it as a point to emphasize the inconsistency of having such a position. Again, there is no proof whatsoever that the erroneous doctrine of baptizing for the dead was practiced. It's thought that it may have been. The question, why are they then baptizing for the dead, proclaims the foolishness of doing such a thing. If there is no such thing as a resurrection. In effect, both questions of the scripture are the same. The portrayal of inconsistencies of such action. Continuing on, he says, Now with all that being said, there remain two other options, both of which are plausible, and one of which is probably the truth. One is that the word baptized used here is the same word used in Matthew 20, 22, and 23, Mark 10, 39, and Luke 12, 50. The use of the word here is in the sense of being overwhelmed with calamities, trials, and sufferings. And as meaning that the apostle and others were subjected to great trials on account of the dead. That is, in the hope of the resurrection, or with the expectation that the dead would rise. That the word baptize here is used to denote a deep sinking into calamities where there can be no doubt. And as that the apostles and the early Christians subjected themselves or were subjected to great and overwhelming calamities on account of the hope of the resurrection. Remember, there were people that did not believe Jesus rose just as there are today. The interpretation also argues, or agrees, sorry, with the general tenor of the argument, and it is an argument for the resurrection, not against. It also implies that this was the full and constant belief of all who endured these trials, that there would be a resurrection of the dead. The argument would be that they should be slow to adopt an opinion which would imply that all their sufferings were endured for nothing. And that God had supported them in this would be in vain. God had plunged them into all these sorrows and had sustained them only to disappoint them. That's not the God that we serve, is it? So to answer the question directly, Paul was addressing the errors, the incorrect doctrine that the people were trying to make true. You cannot baptize someone into salvation after their death. In fact, we as believers know that baptism is not salvation anyway. Church, there is a denomination that preaches baptism. It is an error. It is wrong. The next question that comes from Psalm or comes from Psalms, it's based on chapter 76, verse 10, and it reads, Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remnant of wrath you will be put you will put on like a belt. So here's the question that I, I'm getting from this. How does this work out? What does that mean? Now, I admit, I don't know exactly what was meant by the question, so I am going to take a stab at this. 
According to the Bridgewater Bible Commentary, this verse is described as this. Angry rebellion against God is turned into a source of praise to him. For his triumph brings glory to his name. Since God will be glorified, whether the people submit or rebel, they will do well to bring glory to him willingly by offering true and humble worship. Based on this explanation, there are some places in history where I can see this fitting in. I'm going to share one of them with you today. We're going to look at Exodus 1, 15 through 22. It says, Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shiphrah and the other Pua, When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male, the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born in, to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. All right, so go with me for a minute on this verse. Here we see the new king. This is the new Pharaoh, not the one that was there when Joseph was in Egypt. He gets angry with God's people. We know that. That's how they left Egypt in the first place. He decides that he is going to exterminate all of them through what is called an edict. He gave this edict to the midwives. He commanded them, if you will. So by this edict, he commanded the destruction of all Hebrew male children. He told the midwives to kill the, kill the males when they were born, but they feared God, and the Hebrew people grew and grew and grew. What did that do? We see that it really ticked Pharaoh off even more. Even matter to this point that he told them, now drown all the males in the Nile River. So did that anger, that anger that Pharaoh had towards God, did it praise God? Indeed, it did. You see, Pharaoh's edict did not destroy God's people. It only bounced an infant Moses out of the river and into the lap of Pharaoh's very own daughter. From which position Moses eventually delivered God's people, destroying Pharaoh and all his hosts in the process. There are many other examples like this all through scripture where being angry with God produced something really great. It's all about God turning evil into good. Now, the last two questions I'm going to share today are not scripture-related, but more doctrinal-related. They're both controversial in nature, but they're really good questions, and I really think they needed to be shared. So, here we go. Question five today was, does the Bible actually say that women cannot preach the Bible to men or to be a pastor? The short answer to this question, the easiest one in the world, is two letters. No! There's nowhere in the Bible that says that. 1 Corinthians, however, 14, 34 through 35 is where this question comes from. It says, The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Paul is talking about a whole lot of things before he says this verse. 
He's talking about speaking in tongues in the church, having people to interpret, how it should not be disruptive, how it shouldn't disrupt the service, and lots of stuff like that. He said in verse 26, What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. The use of the word each one, it actually contradicts the later verse that speaks out against women. Each one is everyone, which would mean men and women. Now the second verse that brings the original question to light is found in 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15. It reads, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So this epistle, this letter, was a personal letter written to Timothy directly, dealing with problems that were arising in the church of Ephesus. If it was written to the church of Ephesus, he would have started the letter that way. That would be consistent with Paul's writings. This was directly to Timothy. Mainly had to deal with the false teachings. Again, we go back to erroneous doctrine. The false teachings that were coming about in this church. You see, God knew all about the enemy of the false gospels that would be coming about. He knows about them today. We're not immune to this church. It's happening just as it did in Paul's time. So let's continue on. False teaching was clearly Paul's primary concern in writing this letter because he jumps immediately into the issue at the beginning of the letter. Instead of giving, again, his normal greeting of thanksgiving, he said, Dear Timothy. Unlike many of Paul's letter, this letter, again, specific to this issue. Providing additional weight to the problem facing the churches in Ephesus. In the context of this letter, which again is dealing with false teachings, I want you to understand that. Paul writes, women learn in silence with full submission. You have to understand, teaching women in that time was very uncommon. They weren't taught. These women, according to Paul, were unlearned in the faith. So it was probable that they could have unknowingly been advancing a false teaching. It seems likely that Paul is referring to the way in which learning required submission to a teacher. It appears that there was tension or conflict during the worship. A few verses before we see in 1 Timothy 2 and 8, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. It is very possible that women may have contributed to the, to the disruptiveness of the service. Remember back in verse 12, he said, remain quiet, which is why Paul would call for submission. So here's the cool part that I see through all of this. Looking in the original language for meaning, the Greek word for authority that is used here is authentis. This word is found only one time in the New Testament, so its meaning is not really clear. Other Greek words more typically used to indicate having authority over, such as exosia. So it's likely that authentis had a different connotation than merely having authority. Now, there are other Greek sources mm -hmm. where the word authentis is often associated with violence. Now, according to lexographers, you know those brainiac people that write the dictionaries? Mm -hmm. They study all the languages? Mm -hmm. They're saying that the word authentis is synonymous with to dominate someone. 
So in this case, Paul is most likely prohibiting women from teaching men in a manner that is domineering. Why does Paul reference Adam and Eve? Simple. Paul is using Adam and Eve to correct the women who were acting in a manner which was domineering to men. It must be noted that he is opposing the idea that women are superior to men. He's not claiming, no, not once did he claim, that men were superior to women. Paul is not saying that women cannot teach men because Adam was created first but that women should not dominate men because they are not superior to men. But they were created to be partners with men. When Paul writes that the woman was deceived and became a transgressor, he's not claiming that the fall resulted in a woman assuming authority over a man, but that false teaching led to this transgression. This brings us back to focus on false teaching, erroneous doctrine that heavily occupies this entire letter to Timothy. Paul is concerned with the behavioral results of this false teaching. Can you see that? Okay. The strange verse that, where he said that women will be saved through childbirth makes more sense now in the light of context of Artemis worship. The Artemis cult was popular in Ephesus at that time, and Artemis was a fertility goddess and protector of women. Paul is claiming, through this verse, that women do not need to look to Artemis to protect them through childbirth, but rather to Christ. So again, Paul's addressing a particular problem specific to the church of Ephesus in which a false teaching was resulting in inappropriate behavior. Paul was not giving a universal order to all women at all times not to teach or have authority over a man, but was ordering that women do not assume superiority over men or promote false teachings. Women should learn first being educated in the faith before they teach. It's clear from Paul's other letters that Paul supports women teachers and leaders. Priscilla was a minister of the gospel who taught a man, Apollos. Look to Acts 18.26. And in 2 Timothy, Paul asked Timothy to greet Priscilla and Aquila in Acts 4.19. Surely this verse is not meant to be pers prescriptive to women for all time, especially if Paul also commands women leaders and teachers. He said that they did a great job. Now there's still division over this in churches today. And these two scriptures, in my opinion, it boils down to two words. Complementar complementarianism and egalitarianism. These are two views used to describe the role of women in the church. Complementarianism is a view that women are limited regarding leadership roles in church. They can be an elder, pastor, or deacon, but non-ordained. Egalitarianism is a view that women can serve in all forms of church leadership, including ordination as pastors. Now, if you believe that we as men and women are created by God to be partners or as God called Eve a helpmate, then egalitarianism is the only way to be. Church, we are all equals. We are in this together. Is it fun? You having fun with this? Yeah. Okay. All right, last question. It's a tough one, but again, controversial, but I'm going to give you my take. Question six was, what will happen to all of the millions of aborted babies, especially if the mother is never saved or asked for forgiveness? My answer on this is pretty simple. I am of the belief that if a child 
cannot comprehend the understanding of the gospel and to make the decision on their own to accept the salvation that comes from Jesus Christ, that he will have mercy on them and they will be in heaven. We need to remember that the Bible does not address specifically abortion. But there are a few verses that, in my opinion, address this. The first key is from the only passage in Bible where something specific is said about the death of an infant. In 2 Samuel 12, we learn of David's affair with Bathsheba, another man's wife. David was informed by the prophet Nathan that the child produced by that union would die. David then began to fast and pray, asking the Lord not to carry out his judgment. But when the child died, David got up from praying and fasting and ate something. When asked about his behavior, David uttered the words recorded in 2 Samuel 12, 23. Now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him. But he shall not return to me. David's words reflect a clear understanding that the child could not come back to earth. But David would be with that child one day in heaven. This indicates not only David's assurance of his own future, but also the assurance that his child would share that future with him. From this account, we can conclude that infants who die are destined for heaven. The second key to dealing with this issue is an understanding of the character and attributes of God. A God of justice must punish sin. For the Bible teaches us in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. So therefore, neither an unborn child or an aborted baby has the opportunity to willfully sin. Remember, though, every child conceived bears the sin nature inherited from Adam and is therefore subject to judgment. But at the same time, God reveals himself in Psalm 136, 26, where he says, his faithful love endures forever. We see it again in Psalm 145, 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. So church, it could be very well that God, in his grace, applies the sacrifice of Christ to the unborn victims of abortion. We know Christ's blood is sufficient for such a thing. After all, 1 John 2.2, 2, we read that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. The Bible does not specifically say whether or not an unborn child dies and goes to heaven. Without a clear passage, we can only speculate based on what I shared with you today. However, we know of God's love, His goodness, and his compassion. We know of David's confidence that he would be with his child again. And we know that Jesus invited the children to come to him. Based on these sureties, I believe it is appropriate to conclude that the souls of the children that have been aborted are immediately in the presence of God. Now the second part of the question what are the mothers that were not saved or asked for forgiveness? Well, they would fall under the law of sin. Like anyone else on the face of the earth, if they don't 
call upon the name of Jesus and invite him to be their Lord and their Savior, admitting that they were a sinner and they need him. They have chosen their lot and they will reside in the depths of hell for eternity. Well, that's it. That's all I got for the first stump of the pastor. <laughs> And we are pretty much out of time. So what I'm going to say is, did you like this? Yes. Hey, we'll try to make this at least an annual thing. I'll give you guys a time to come up with questions. And I hope that the questions were answered appropriately to those of you that wrote them. I hope that helped. If you'll join me in prayer. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your wisdom, for your knowledge, for your ability to teach us about life through your words, through your actions, through your kindness, through your mercy, through your forgiveness. Lord, before we go into communion today, I have to ask the question, if there's anyone in this room today that would fall in that category of not knowing that they know that they know that they will rest with you in eternity, right where they're at, just be bold and raise your hand. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to ask you to come down. I just want you to have that opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I don't want you to end up like those that choose their own lot. For the rest of us, as we get ready to enter into communion, let's cleanse our hearts and our minds and our souls as we rededicate our lives to Christ. So if you would, say after me, Father God, I am a sinner. And I thank you for providing a way to spend eternity with you. I've given my life to Christ. I thank you for the cleansing that comes from that. For the forgiveness of my sins. For completing me. For healing my wrongs. And for forgiving me for everything that happens. I ask you to prepare, prepare my spirit now to accept communion to be with you today. Lord, thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So if you'll grab out your communion cups, peel back the layer, and as you do that, and you take out the wafer, as I do every Sunday, I want to share the importance of this day, of being able to share a meal. Does everybody have one? Everybody good? Okay. This bread, this wafer, represents the bread that Jesus broke with his disciples the night of the Last Supper. After giving thanks, he broke the bread and he told them, Take, eat, this is my body, which will be broken for you. And every time you do of this, remember me. He knew what was going to happen to him. And he gave them a way to spend eternity. Then after taking the cup of wine, he gave thanks and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. He took what was old, he made it new. No longer needing an animal sacrifice. It's over, it is finished, it was done with him. And he told them that every time they drink of this cup, remember him. Remember today, church. bow your heads with me again. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for inquiring minds, for questions that come that only you can truly answer. And you provide the resources for those answers to come. Lord, I thank you for church family and for what it means to be a body of Christ. Without those here, we may not have our fingers or our toes or our arms or our legs. Lord, again, a special blessing on the cards that are being mailed out on Monday that you have chosen those you want to fill these seats. And as you do that, Lord, give us the strength to persevere. Give us the wisdom to disciple and to help those that do not know you come to a relationship 
with you. As we leave this place, I speak safety and health over everyone here. Father, bring them safely back to us next week. And those that are part of our flock that are sick today, we speak healing again into their lives. Touch them, Lord. Let them know that we love them and we care for them and that we're here for them. Jesus, thank you for everything you've done. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you for the opportunities that you give me to deliver your will. I look forward to you, Father God, in the time that all of us will rejoice within the walls of the new Jerusalem. In Jesus' name, amen. Go forth into the world, loving God, loving people, and living your design. See you next week.